Welcome back everyone to Learning to Read Sumerian, Lesson 5. Today we're going to be talking about how verbs are formed. So we'll look at what verbal inflection is, what the difference is between the past and present tense, and should we even be using these terms, and then finally looking at the two basic types of verbs in Sumerian. They are classified as hamtu and maru. So what is verbal inflection? Well, inflection refers to the ways in which a word can change in order to alter its meaning. What in the world does that mean? Well, we do it in English like this. The English verb jump. In the infinitive, we say to jump. In the present, we say jumps or is jumping. The past, jumped and the future will jump. So all of these modifications to the verbal base jump, to jump, jumps, is jumping, all of these things are inflecting the verb. And you can see in this English verb jump, it stays the same. The J-U-M-P stays the same. Uh, it's everything that's added to, around it. That's what modifies the meaning. It inflects the meaning. So this is verbal inflection in English. But I wanted to give another example because this is going to come up in Sumerian. The English verb sit. We have to sit, he sits, he is sitting, so all of that is the same. But in the past, he sat. So the verb changes internally, changes the actual form of the verbal base for the past tense. And we get this in a lot of English verbs, run, ran, fall, fell. So this is not uncommon to us, we understand it, and this is what, in, in one way, this is going to happen in Sumerian. So in the same way that in English we don't always inflect verbs in the same way, Sumerian does not either. So we need to be aware of that. In Sumerian, there are a couple of ways in which the verb can be inflected or formed or changed in order to change its tense. So those two are called hamtu and maru. So the hamtu is roughly the past tense, and the maru is roughly the present or future tense. So let's talk about that for a second. Using the word tense with some of these ancient languages can be tricky. We should probably think more in terms of completed action and incomplete action. They call that the perfect and the imperfect. But for now, let's just keep things simple and think past tense and present tense. The verb nyar means to set or to place or to put. So if we say mu'un yar, that means he set, past tense. That's how we're going to think of this. And mu'un nyan ya, mu'un yatu nyatu, this is the present future. He sets or he will set. It can be either one. The past tense, what we're calling hamtu. The regular or basic form of the verb is the hamtu form. It's usually the past tense. So the verb that you've seen so many times in these lessons, do three, to build. If you say mu'un do three, he built. La tu, to extend or to hang. Mu'un la tu, he extended. Shum tu, to give. Mu'un shum tu is he gave. Uh, so dim tu, mu'un dim tu, he formed. Something that we need to point out is the N that appears before the verbal base. We'll talk about this probably in the next lesson. But this N is part of the way that hamtu verbs indicate their agent, their subject of a transitive verb. But that N before the verbal base is he. Notice there's no inflection to the verbal base. It's just the simple, regular, basic form of the verb. Now, if that sort of makes sense, you're right on track, it will become clear when we go through the next slides. So the maru forms, the present or future tense, this is the modified form of the verb. It's usually present or future tense, and there are three different ways that it can be formed. One, you can add an e to the end of the verb. So, la tu, again, is to extend or to hang. Mu la tu, eh, he will extend or she will extend. 
or he extends, present tense. Bod, to open. Mu bod e, he will open. Dim tu, to form or to fashion. Mu dim tu e, he will form. The e there is what you need to remember. There's an e on the end like that. It can indicate a maru form. So you want to think in terms of present tense or future tense. So some maru verbs are formed not by adding that e at the end, but by doubling the verbal base. So in the hum to, mu'un gi for, gi for means to turn or to return. So mu'un gi for would be he returned. However, in the maru, they would say mu gi for gi for. He will return or he returns, present future. Now, notice that the shape of the verbal base didn't change. It's gi for in the hum to and gi for as well. In the maru, it just doubles it. Some maru verbs actually change the form of the verbal base when they double. The verb nyar, as we've seen already, means to set. In the hamtu, mu nyar, he set. But in the maru, mu nyatu nyatu. So nyar not only doubles, but it actually changes the form of the verb. So nyar goes to nyatu. Now, something to remember here we're going to see it in a couple of slides, is that there is a form of the verb where the hum to base will double. And we call that hum to reduplication or free reduplication. So the first way that they modify the maru form is by adding an e. The second way is by doubling the verbal base. The third is by just completely changing the form. So these you just kind of got to memorize. Now here we're only going to deal with the singular. Um, so there is hamtu singular, there's maru singular, there's hamtu plural, and there's maru plural. The verb do eleven to say or to speak. We've seen it before. Dug for or do eleven. In the hamtu, it's do eleven. But in the maru, it goes to a to carry or to bring. In the hamtu, it's da six. So mu'un da six. He brought. He carried. However, if you see tum tu or tum three, the form tum, this is maru. So do eleven goes to a in the maru. Uh, da six goes to tum two or tum three. To go or to walk, another very common verb is nyen in the ham tu, but do in the maru. So the three different ways are forming with an e after the verbal base doubling of the verbal base, and just completely changing, like sit to sat. One last thing, as we mentioned before, there's something called hamtu reduplication, and this is sometimes a hamtu verb will double its base. We're not going to get into all the specifics of the different meanings. Of course, some of these meanings are debated. But basically, if you want to think about, it could be referring to plurality, either of the subject or the object depends on the sentence, or intensity, or repetition, etc. If you've studied Akkadian or um, Hebrew, it's sort of, they, uh, they make it uh, comparable to the D stem or to the PL. It could indicate intensity or repetition. Again, you don't need to really worry about the meaning right now. That'll come up on a case-by-case -case basis. All I want you to be aware of is that sometimes a hamtu verb will reduplicate. So if you see a reduplication of a verb, you need to ask the question, is this hamtu reduplication or is this maru reduplication? It's probably going to be maru, but you have to allow for a hamtu reduplication. So an example here would be mu'un yar nyar, he set them. So the them there is indicating plurality of the object. But again, don't be terribly concerned with that. Okay, so that's an introduction to the hamtu and maru, the past and present future. Let's take a look at our vocabulary. So la tu, we've seen to extend or to hang. Ak means to do or to make. Bod means to open. Gi for, very common verb, to turn or to return. Da six, to bring or to carry. Neshtuk tu, ear or wisdom. Uh, mutu, to grow. Matu, a boat or a ship. 
Sung il tu, this is a compound verb, to raise the head. So il tu means to raise, sung means head. Sung gid tu, gid tu is uh, to become long. So to make the head long, it has to do with the forehead. Uh, to become angry, gid tu is to be long. Temen is foundation. Tud is to give birth. Tug tu is clothing. Na for is a stone. And igi nyar, uh, to put the eye, to set the eye, is to look at. Our exercises, and again, as you do these, please feel free to email us, digitalhammurabi at gmail.com. There are several people that are taking this course that email me their exercises, and I, uh, I try to give really quick turnaround, correct them, or just tell you how amazing you are for getting them right. So, lugal a, etu, mu un, du three. Dingir re, nyeshtug tu, mu un, shum tu. Lu tu e, alan, mu, dim tu e. So we haven't had alan yet, but I want you to use EPSD, the Electronic Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary. Uh, for Alan, I'm pretty sure the link is in the description. But uh, look up Alan and then try to make out what that sentence means. Nin uru shethri ba gi four. Uh, ba here is uh, a conjugation prefix. Uh, we we briefly went over that in the last lesson, but uh, it's you can roughly treat it like mu here. Don't worry about the nuances of the differences between ba and mu. Just treat it as the beginning of the verbal chain. N A two she three ba gi four gi four. Dingir lugal ra mu na du eleven. Nin dingir ra mu na e. Ama e a mu tum tu. And finally, lugal e. Ning tu, mu de six, de six. And I want you to ask yourself, is this hamtu or maru? Finally, our signs. Uh, you can go on to EPSD and see the OR3 forms that are there. But these are forms that come out of Katharina Mittermeier's Alta Babylonische Zeichenliste, which is an excellent resource to have. I recommend that you get it if you're serious about taking Sumerian, and I think if you're here in Lesson 5, you probably are. So, nu, sheish, ab, ti, ri, gi, notice it's not gi4, this is the gi sign, nam, and mush3. Mush3, if you see a dinger before it, that is the sign for anana. Okay, that's Lesson 5. Again, digitalhammurabi at gmail.com. Please feel free to email me any questions, uh, if you need any clarifications, if you want me to check your exercises, if you just want to chat about Sumerian a little bit, or leave a comment on the video below, and uh, we respond as quickly as we can to each of those. Uh, until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that?